The following is a production of Salt and Light Radio in Boise, Idaho. Kick off your work boots and pull up a boulder. It's time for Man Cave. Discussing the issues that affect Catholic men in today's culture. Grab your favorite beverage, pick out a comfy spot around the campfire, and enjoy today's conversation with our two favorite cavemen, Pat King and Brian Howe. Hello, this is Pat King with Pat King's Man Cave. I think we're going to do a name change or make it easier to find on YouTube uh, uh, through the Salt and Light Radio Boise channel on YouTube. Uh, you can just uh, select the Man Cave. You'll find me easier that way if you just put in uh, Man Cave Pat King or Pat King's Man Cave. It should come up once you get on YouTube. Um, I don't know of all the other places we're on yet as, uh, as we're trying to expand access. Um, so uh, we're getting there. And self-promotion is, again, not my favorite thing to do. But Jesus... Yeah, I was talking to Eddie Trask this morning uh, before we were doing our live show, and, and he said the same thing. And I said, we got to look at the way Jesus got the word out of his message. He would heal someone, and then he'd immediately tell him, go and tell no one. I mean, come on now. That's almost a challenge, <laughs> you know, when you're told to not go and tell someone something that phenomenally happened. I mean, you have leprosy. You, you're, you're the scourge of... You've been ostracized out in the out in the boonies in this camp, and no one wants you, no one loves you, no one visits you. Your family can't come and see you for fear that they're going to get it. So Jesus heals you, clears you up, and makes you whole again, and then you he tells you to not say anything. Come on, what's up with that? I, that's the last thing you want to do is not say anything. You're you're full of joy and full of uh, happiness. So again, in in and I told Eddie, I said, you know, so you kind of need to look at it this way. Uh, Jesus really didn't have to do a lot of self-promoting, but he did, in a way, use a little reverse psychology to get people to promote him. And uh, and so that's all we're trying to do. We're trying to bring you closer to Christ, uh, have a deeper, more meaningful relationship with the with your church, deepen your family's uh, relationship with Christ, and and the ultimate goal is to lead to salvation. Uh, for our, for all of us, and uh, so that's that's our whole goal is to bring everyone back into one community, bring those lost sheep back in, and and men's ministry is is where I feel that I have a call to to bring about. So with that being said, I'm going to further go into the book by Henry J. M. Nowen, uh, the Return of the Prodigal Son. It's amazing how. A parable with, I'm not sure how many verses there are in it, how many sentences, lines, but it's it's not a very big part of the Bible. It's a very small um, portion of the, of the Gospels. And yet, this book is 144 pages of in-depth study of the prodigal son, and it looks at it in such a manner. In fact, I'll probably do a couple more episodes on this because there's so much in here. Uh, it breaks it down by the younger son, the older son, and the father, and how it all relates to how we we transition through our lives. We were all younger sons or younger children, younger men at one time. And if you have a brother you, and you're the younger one or you're the elder one, at one point you were the youngest in the family. And so this transitions, this shows you how we as younger kids are, are demanding, spoiled, we're the baby, whatever you are, your thoughts are more selfish. Your thoughts are more what I want, what I need, what's best for me. You're not thinking about what's good. In fact, you're probably more jealous and, and want more taken away from your older siblings because you think they get, they got it all. They got it made. They get the best. Um, I the fourth child of seven, then the middle child. And I don't think I received new clothes until um, I was about 13 or 14. Um, I, I mean, maybe I'd get a shirt. I knew I got underwear, uh, maybe some socks. But as far as new actual clothes that were mine, I think I had to start buying my own. My, my mom would buy a couple things for school so that we, you know, started off the school year, but 
you know, we were not well off. I mean, my single mom raising seven kids on her own. My father was uh, not a very involved father. He paid the very minimum amount he could uh, in child support. And my mom did the best she could. Like I've said in past episodes, my mom was the, was the worst father a child could have, but she was the best one I had. And I, 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 I love her to death. I, 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 I was very grateful for all her sacrifices that she made for us kids. And at the time we didn't think they were sacrifices. We thought you were just denying us, you know, but she never really let on how bad things were. But so as we grow older and I've got a, I've got two younger sisters and a younger brother. I, I no longer was the younger son. I had to become the responsible elder son. And, uh, and so that took on a different level of, of tolerance, patience, problems. You know, I still wanted to be a young child, but I had to grow up and be responsible. So as you get older, you see these transitions and we don't, we really don't look back as we grow at how things are changing, how things have changed or how we want them to change. And some people, um, I was at a concert last night, a Dave Matthews concert and, and our supervisor, I'm, I do event security there. And our, our supervisor said, that basically the crowd will be a bunch of 50-year-old kindergartens, k- kindergartners that are now empty nesters. And so they're going to blow off steam. I mean, come on, it was a Tuesday night, and they're out there drinking and partying until 11 o'clock at night uh, at a concert. And so, and, and, and I looked out, and I see this crowd, and yeah, I saw some young people, but the majority of them were, were probably older, as old or older than me. And... Um, living, living their childhood again, uh, and, and getting stupid and silly. Um, so that being said, then as we leave elder son status and then we become, we get married and start having kids on our own, we have to put away childish things. We, we have to, we now have responsibility for other human beings, our own children. We have responsibilities that, that duties that call to us. And, and if you, and if you can't get over your childhood, you're going to wreck your marriage. You're going to, um, you're, you're going to make your kids your best friends, but now you're not going to have authority over them. I, I see it many different ways. Yes, you can, your children can be your best friend and they, you can have authority. It's hall in hall and it's in hall and excuse me. It's how you do it, it's how you do, how you come about to treating them with the respect and leadership that you have as a parent to, to be that parent. Um, I'm a novice at that. I, I didn't do so well with my own kids because I didn't have a, I didn't have a father showing me how to do things. I, I know that sounds like an excuse, but I learned way too late how to be a parent and a, um, and a, a friend to my child. But I think parenthood is primarily your first role as that. And as they get older, I think that's when you build the friendship, but that's just my own opinion. So this book, the prodigal son talks about, um, many different aspects of a family. And really it comes down to this really depicts the relationship between God and and his son, Jesus, and, and how we are supposed to convert ourselves over time into these transitional periods to where now we're, we're the father welcoming back the lost sheep, the, the, the prodigal son, the, the, the son or the daughter that have left the fold and how you, you need to, to transition yourself into one of when, it, when a child does reach out to you that co- wants to come back or, or even engage with you at some level, you, you need to not be the, that condemning force, but that welcoming force because the only way you help them change their lives is by access to them. And if you're not going to be there for them, if you're not going to be that father that says, come back, I love you. You were, you were dead and now you're found. Uh, you're lost and now you're found. You were dead and now you're alive. I know that's difficult because we get emotionally tied to why they left or the things they said, but as God would want you to be like him. And that's the whole goal of our lives is to be more godlike. 
that transition has to occur for you to have any influence or an effect on that child's return. I, and, and I know the world is broken like crazy. There's a lot of kids that don't even talk to their parents anymore, have absolutely no respect for them. And you all got to be St. Monica's. Um, I, I think Augustine gave her, her his mom a, a, a real world of hurt and worry, but she prayed so fervently that eventually he became one of our greatest saints of all time because she was so dedicated to loving him and welcoming him back and encouraging him to come back and praying for him. Now, she also did things, you know, encouragement with other bishops and priests to, to you know, push uh, Augustine along. But uh, in the end, it was that constant open-heartedness of St. Monica's life to her son, to her child, who she loved, to bring him back and to pray for him to become a Christian again. And as you know, the end results are phenomenal. He's written a lot of books. He's one of the most quoted uh, saints around. And uh, so, I mean, many episodes, I mean, many uh, websites and, and organizations, the Augustine Institute, is based on, you know, they take that spirituality and that holiness from St. Augustine. So to bring up, I, I would really recommend everybody getting this book. Uh, uh, Henry J.M. Nowen, uh, N-O-U-W-E-N, The Return of the Prodigal Son. It's like, I think I paid 13 bucks on Amazon for it. Um, it. I'm not a big reader, so for me to promote a book and talk about it, it had to really... Hit a, hit a nerve with me because I saw myself, as this author does, in every aspect of the prodigal son, the younger son, the older son, and the father. And, and he talks about Rembrandt. This is really based on Rembrandt's painting of the prodigal son. And it's amazing how this book came out of the fact that he sat there, saw a poster of the prodigal son, was enamored by it, and had to, it was fi transfixed. He had to keep he had to keep looking at it and staring into it and wanted to know more about it. So he went to St. Petersburg, the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, uh, Russia, was where he sat for hours, and actually over a couple of days, several hours, a co uh, couple of days in a row, just observing the real painting and noticing all the details, how the left hand and the right hand are different shapes and different size. One's more masculine, one's more effeminate. How the light shines on the father's forehead down to the sun, and it, it's it's just enlightening how he he decide he describes the painting and how Rembrandt was so torn by his own losses over his he lost many children in his lifetime and and he had that prodigal son's beginning of of you know being married and living a tawdry life and going to bars and and stuff like that and and I think if you if you read more on Rembrandt you'll see how his life life changed as his life had changed um, the death of his own children his wife um, so anyway this is a great book if you really want to deepen your 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 journey as a man but also understand God's love for you, how, how welcoming God is to you regardless of your lifestyle, your past, what you've done. It, it really is, was transformative to me. It's probably a book I'll refer to and reread again and again. Um, I've earmarked a few things in here, and like I said, I'll probably do some more podcasts because there's many different parts of this book that are very worth going into in depth. Um, so there's a page 116. Uh, it's about the father, not without sorrow. And uh, if that if that is God's way, then I am challenged to let go of all the voices of doom and damnation that drag me into depression and allow the small joys to reveal the truth about the world I live in. When Jesus speaks about the world, he is very realistic. He speaks about wars, revolutions, earthquakes, plagues, and famines. 
persecution and imprisonment, betrayal, hatred, and assassinations. There is no suggestion at all that these signs of the world's darkness will ever be absent. But still, God's joy can be ours in the midst of it all. It is the joy of belonging to the household of God, whose love is stronger than death, and who empowers us to be in the world while already belonging to the kingdom of joy. So I, I, I mentioned this because we look at the world right now with all the chaos, the wars, we think it's going to hell in a handbasket. We think the world is just not worth living. I mean, you, you look at a lot of the youth, all the youth suicides, the drug addictions, the alcoholism, the, the fornication, everything that's going on is not something that we, it's just happening now. It's something that's been in our midst since the time Jesus walked, since before that. This is not new. It's, it's like uh, Billy Graham, I, I like saying this because it's one of the things that stuck with me. Remember, if you remember Billy Graham, he used these big stadium arenas for, uh, for these evangelization tent meetings. And I, I would watch him from time to time because I was very interested in how the, how the non-Catholic world viewed religion and, and spirituality and faith. And, and Billy Graham was probably the best non-Catholic Catholic out there because he spoke of truth. He talked about sin. He talked about life. He talked about the salvation of, of God. The only thing he lacked was, one, being a priest, and two, um, talked about the Eucharist. He, he was not a Catholic, but he was so, so pure in, in, his, in his argument for, for redemption. And the one thing he said was, he said, you know, our, our current world is not very— I mean, I'm paraphrasing. This is not word for word because I, I think I heard this back when I was in my early teens— 14, 15 years old, it was black and, I don't know, was it black and white? I don't remember. Um, <laughs> it's been a long time. Um, but he was on stage and he was talking to the audience. He says, the world is not very creative. We have not come up with a new sin since before Christ walked. And I said, every sin is the same. We just may go about it in a different way or a different culture. But every sin is, is it, that we do today is the same type of sin that we've been doing since Adam and Eve, you know, murder, uh, adultery, uh, homosexuality, all these sins have been around. We're, we're not, we're not creating anything. No one's come up with a new sin and said, Oh, that's a new one. It, it may be just done by different people and, and maybe in a different way, but deception, de betrayal, uh, corporate takeovers, uh, espionage, assassination, all these things are happening all the time. And it's, it's how you choose to live your life. If you want to live in that world and let that world control you, it will be a world of no joy, no happiness. Um, you fear all the time. You live a depressed life without any hope of salvation. And that's how people tend to fall away from God is they, they don't see the hope and they don't see the joy. And I, I'm living proof that, that you can have great losses um, I, I've told you about my son's passing, but he was born with all these, a lot of medical problems. And I lived through all that. And I lived through, uh, great losses financially. Um, I, I used to be worth, you know, 10, $12 million, um, with assets, with land, with my business was doing well. Um, I thought I had the world by the tail. I was growing doing well and everything just came crashing in. And, and that, that when that happened, when I had that big last loss, um, my wife walked out on me. Uh, my children don't talk to me. I lost a, a fortune and I almost went totally bankrupt. And when I reached the bottom of my depths, I still, I knew there was something better out there for me. And I didn't let the world control me to the point where I gave up and giving up is a, is a lot of, is, is easy for thing for anyone to do when things go wrong. It's easy just to give up and throw in a towel and start drinking or, or you know, do drugs and, and, and maybe, you know, go you know, have 
extramarital affairs just because it just you're numb and you don't know how to live without it. So you've got to find something that gives you that you think is pleasure. It's permanent pleasure, but it's just very temporary. And so when I lost everything and my wife moved out and, and I live on a property, I, I, I had 80 acres. I had a five acre parcel and a 75 and I lost a, $2 million investment on a 75 acre property that was worth a lot. Plus my business I had 28 employees and I basically lost everything in a matter of a year and a half, two years. My wife left, my kids graduated. They don't talk to me anymore. And you could think that there's reason for me to be a heavy drinker and a, and a partier and just, you know, go live life. You know, it's all, it all sucks now. It's terrible. It, it, your life has ended. Don't worry. You know, everything you worked for is gone. I mean, I worked, I'm self-employed. I've worked most of my life and everything I built up for, for a future retirement, for a future, you know, um, uh, financial security, happy wife and all this stuff is gone, just gone. And, and not only that, but I live, the five acres I still own is adjacent to the 75 that I got to look at all the time. My, the, the commercial greenhouses I built and the vineyards gone. I put in a 50 acre vineyard. That's all been ripped out. The, the dairy across the street bought that land and tore all the vineyard out. Of course, they, they need feed for their, for their animals, for their cows. And so all that's gone. And, and for a, couple years there especially before I returned to the church I was trying to find ways to seek my revenge for something that happened to me that wasn't their fault but I was trying to get them back and someone told me says that won't change anything and and what you're doing is unethical and immoral and and it slapped me upside the head but it was another man that challenged me on my desires to seek revenge because I was angry I, I had no joy. I had no hope for a brighter future. I was just angry as hell. I wanted, I wanted to retribution. I, I just, I sought um, to seek my revenge to somehow punish them for me, what happened to me, and that is how I ended up coming back to the Catholic faith. Was that. That man, a friend of mine, that man that challenged me on my my desire to cause harm to someone else that really didn't deserve the harm they got, was, I was seeking, um, basically slapped me in the face and said, grow up, be a man, this is wrong, I'm not going to help you do what you wanted to do. Because I tried to get him to help me um, you know, cause their acquisition of my land problems. And he just wouldn't participate. And, and I didn't think, fortunately, I knew I knew enough that I, I couldn't do it without his help. And he wasn't going to play my game. So, um, again, that's, that's where I was. I wasn't, I wasn't going to church. I wasn't seeking God. I was, I was resentful and angry. And my wife left me. And all these things built up. In fact, that's how I started remodeling my house was uh, my wife had taken everything. And I had nothing left really to speak of. So I, I took it out on the cabinetry in the kitchen. Um, and so um, I thought, well, I'm going to make this my own. So that's how I got started in, in tearing out things. And But I kept hearing God's voice saying, come back to me, come back to me. You need to come back to me. And um, this is, you know, it, it, I was I went to other churches and just wasn't, didn't feel like this is where I need to be. And one day I did ask God, and, I, and I've said this many times before, but it's, it's relevant to this, sub, this, this prodigal son story, was that I, I come out of this church service. It was a Sunday morning. It was Easter. Kids are running around. Everyone's in flip-flops and, and Hawaiian shirts. And it was a nice warm, you know, we live in Idaho, so Easter can be cold. I think it was a late, later Easter than normal. So, um, you know, they always change, but it's later into the spring, so it's kind of a nice weather day outside. And I'm dressed in nice clothes for Easter because that's kind of the tradition I, you know, in a Catholic family. And I come in, and it's, it's, everyone's in chairs and flip-flops and sitting down and, and wearing Hawaiian shirts and just so 
ir- non reverent. It was it was like this is church on Easter Sunday. And I'm going, okay. And I listened. The sermon was okay, but kids are running around, so I was so distracted. It wasn't really. And I have nothing against kids in the in the in the pews. I think that's the best thing that for them is in a pew during a Sunday service. But to just run around willy nilly without any kind of parental responsibility of, of containment, um, it, it was distracting. And as I leave, I, the, the greeter, the, you know, as you're exiting, said, oh, we hope to see because I was new. Hope to see you next week. And I, I just smiled and say, oh, yeah, sure, thanks. And as I'm walking out, I get into the parking lot and I say, God, this can't be what you, what you want. This, this isn't what church should be like. This, this should be far more in honor and respect of you and your, your mission and, and your life and, and what you sent Jesus for. And not to be pious or anything, but I said, where, where do you want me to be? I need, I need to go somewhere where I can be fed, where, where, the, um, um, where I can be more participatory as well as get more out of it. And as I uh, as I thought about it, you know, and everyone's you know, God speaks to you in different ways. He 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 will enlighten you in a way. He'll send signs or clues, and people don't believe that that's true. But if you really are asking the question and really want the answer, then He will speak to you, but not in a voice that you think is God's. You you will hear a voice that is um, something more familiar to you, maybe. So my grandmother used to call when we were, I was a fallen away Catholic and I was living in Southern California, Palm Springs area. And our son was alive and, and, and with all the medical issues. And my family was very good at praying for me. I have, I have a lot of Catholic family, lots of nuns, some priests, uh, and the time, um, sisters and other convents, as well as I've even got a couple of Mormon family members, but everybody would pray for, for answers, for, for miracles, for healing for our son. Cause he was in and out of hospitals a lot. And my grandmother from time to time now growing up, my grandmother would, would part of living in her household and going to her home and staying any length of time was every night before bed, you, we said the rosary. And she would literally tell her children that that were, especially the ones that were falling away, but it, the ones that weren't, even if they were in college somewhere, she'd call up from time to time and say, well, I've said a rosary for you today. And, and she meant it. You knew that when she said it, it wasn't just some cute little saying just to make you sound good. You know, if someone asks you to pray for them, say you will, but then do. Uh, actually pray for them right then and there. I've, I've learned to say, oh, yeah, I'll pray for you. But now I'm learning to say a prayer, a little prayer for them at that time. So that way I'm true to my word. I'm not just saying it to make them feel better, to placate them. I'm actually going to say a prayer for their behalf. And even on Facebook, if someone says, hey, prayer for us, I don't just say, yeah, amen, gotcha. I actually will, will write out a, a little, may God uh, place his healing hands upon you. Amen. A little simple, a little little prayer right then and there. So she she'd call up and talk a little bit, wanted to see how Lance was doing and and how the family was doing and how kids were doing or you know all that and and at the end she'd say, hey, I just wanted you to let you know I said a prayer for you today or said a rosary for you today, and you know that it, being a non Catholic, you know that didn't mean as much as it does today, especially more my awareness of of when someone offers a prayer for you. But I, I was grateful. I said, thank you. Thank you very much. And, and we'd say goodbye. And, and I knew she meant it and, but I didn't really receive it as being meant for healing and all that. Um, so as I, when I went out that church after that Easter Sunday and I, and I said, uh, God, where do you want me to be? Uh, the voice I heard was my grandmother's voice, you know, it was almost clear as day. But that's where the thought was. And I had my, my grandmother passed 20, 20 some odd years before this happened. Um, and so, I, you know, I don't 
didn't think about my grandmother all the time daily. I, I, I do more now than I did then. Um, but so I hear her voice in my head saying, I said a rosary for you today. And immediately my thought was, oh, maybe I should go check out the Catholic Church. Because remember, I left the church because I thought it was changing. It was not a church that was on the uprise or, or, or staying consistent with their teaching. I thought they were actually just becoming like, like Martin Luther, you know, uh, just like every other Christian church out there, just milk, toast, watered down and, and losing all its uh, strength because it stays stays true to its convictions, to its beliefs, following it and adhering to to Jesus's traditions and methods and and what he taught us. And so I thought they were changing and and I was just didn't really want a part of that decline of the Catholic Church. So I sought a more conservative church to go to. And for a while there, it was pretty good. But it, it still pulled me away. And then I didn't raise my kids that way. I raised them, didn't raise them Catholic. I raised them in a non-denominational or four-square gospel at the time. And so to hear my grandmother's voice after almost 30 years of, of absence from the church, to hear her voice tell me to Rosary, it's like, okay, St. Michael, Michael the Archangel, Archangel defend, defend us in battle. battle. Be, Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Man Cave, a weekly podcast discussing the issues that affect Catholic men in today's culture. A production of Salt and Light Radio in Boise, Idaho. To learn more about our ministry, please visit our website, saltandlightradio.com.